have your Bibles and open them up to Mark chapter 16. Mark chapter 16. It's on the screen, but it's always good to look at your own copy, whether that's a digital or a paper. And uh, sometimes looking at it with different translations kind of helps us get a hold of what's being said. Mark 16, reading from the English Standard Version, verses 15 to 18. And he said to them, he is Jesus, and he said to them, Go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. But whoever does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe in my name. They will cast out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up serpents with their hands. And if they drink any deadly poison, it will not hurt them. They will lay their hands on the sick, and they will recover. This is one of, some people say, the five uh, great commissions we find in Scripture, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Acts, beginning of Acts, where Jesus commissions his disciples. You remember, that's when he said, go, but not quite yet. I want you to go, but I want you to stay first. Wait for the Holy Spirit to come. When we, we look at this and consider what Jesus was saying to these people, his apostles, and he tells them to go into all the world, proclaim the gospel. In verse 17, I want you to just think about this for a minute. These signs will accompany you. No. These signs will accompany the apostles. These signs will accompany those who believe. Amen. Amen. That's us. Yes. That includes us. I think perhaps with what we're seeing in our country right now, that in the midst of division and turmoil, we're seeing revival begin to blossom. Yeah. By the way, I've got to take a side trip. It won't be long. Last Thursday night, last Wednesday night, sorry, last Wednesday night, uh, Chad, and Sarah and myself were invited up to the campus, up to Old Main, the chapel on the second floor of Old Main, for, to be part of a Disciple Makers class that they have these kids come together. They have grown, and they continue to grow every week. I would say there's at least 150 kids in the room, and they invited pastors to come, and they, they worshiped together, and they had, had good teaching, and then they broke out into these small groups, and they gave all of us an opportunity to, to mention, talk about our churches. And there was one young lady that was sitting next to me in our breakout group, Chad and I, the old men were in with this group of young people. And uh, I was asking about where she's from, what her major is and all that. She said, you know, she said, my first year, uh, my first two years here on campus, this was kind of like a eh, handful of kids. But she said, now it's like, it's like, it's like revival. Yeah. 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 And they were engaged. And the conversations were great. And I'm like, these kids didn't bring all this religious baggage. They're just coming to Jesus. Yeah. Gen Z, the revival generation, friends. I'm telling you, God is doing incredible things. And I believe that part of what we're seeing now may be a better awareness of the truth of verse 17. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That there's not the separation between professional clergy and believers. Yeah. I mean, there is authority in the church. God instituted that. But we don't have to wait for the professionals to do all the work. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. These signs will accompany those who believe. Well, John Mark is the author of this letter. Uh, the early church all agreed on that. He is the one who wrote this. Not an original apostle. Uh, would have been a disciple of Peter. Peter would be the one that, that most people believe has led him to the Lord. In uh, the fifth chapter of 1 Peter, Peter identifies Mark as his son. Uh, we know that uh, John Mark was part of Paul's first missionary journey. 
Uh, he was a little immature. We don't know exactly what happened, but he wasn't, didn't want to go on the next one. Uh, anyway, this young man uh, came to faith in Christ and had the honor of writing the first recorded copy that we have of the gospel, probably written in the 50s. So we have here at, at the close of this gospel this great commission that Jesus gave. And it's interesting that in that list it says they will speak with new tongues. Now that was something that didn't happen until later. But that was something that Jesus said, here's what those who believe will be able to do. I, I don't know what their ears thought of that because they had seen Jesus cast out demons. They had themselves cast out demons with Jesus' authority. Uh, they had witnessed uh, Jesus lay his hands on people and not only healed them, but they had seen people rise from the dead. They had seen Jesus' power over nature itself by calming the storms and multiplying the fish and the bread. But in the middle of that is this one little comment, they will speak in new tongues. And I wondered what the apostles thought when they heard that. This whole, this whole thing of tongues is one of the most highly debated issues in the church world. And some people get very vehement about that not being uh, a thing, that, that, is, that is something that ceased. And there are people on the other side who defend it, but they're almost to the point of what the believers in Corinth were, where that's what their whole focus is. I remember being on the road in ministry, and I, people would say, uh, one lady said about the, 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 the Holy Spirit, that was for tongues. And I said, excuse me? Holy Spirit is a whole lot more than tongues. Amen. Holy Spirit is power, right? Amen. Power for service, power for living. But we can't run away from this either. And I, and I want to take some time and just look at this whole thing. The Bible is so clear that this was just a normal activity in the early church, and it's designed to be a normal activity in the church today. And just because we hear speaking in tongues here, and we're a Pentecostal church, we don't speak in tongues because we're a Pentecostal church. We're a Pentecostal church because the gifts of the Spirit are in operation. But these little camps have developed, and there's been all this misinformation, and people are really coming down on both extremes with some really non-biblical ideas. And we really don't have to have non-biblical ideas. We've got the Word of God. Amen. We've got it in every language. We've got it in any flavor that you might want. And for the most part, it's free. If you have internet access and some sort of a device, you can read it in all kinds of languages and, and versions. So yes, Jesus did mention speaking in tongues. These signs these signs will accompany those who believe. In Acts 1.8, Jesus told his disciples when he was uh, saying, go, but not quite yet. Acts 1.8, he said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. He promised them then that they, he would never leave them nor forsake them. He promised them before he went to Calvary that he had to go away, but he was sending another comforter, and it was for their benefit that he would go away. So when we consider the fact that the Holy Spirit was set, the main reason God wants to endue us with power, that baptism in the Holy Spirit, the main reason is power, power to witness. Power to witness. That means that we actually have to get out of our houses. We actually have to get out of our churches and witness for Jesus. Now that can look a lot of different ways. Some of that is dependent upon our own personalities, right? But the main reason that God created a way that we could be immersed in His Holy Spirit is so that we would have power to witness. And we know what happened in Acts 2 verse 4 on the day of Pentecost, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. 
The Spirit gave them utterance, but they began to speak. There was a, there's a cooperation. The same way that there is a cooperation between God and his creation in everything else. God and his Holy Spirit did not drag you to come to church this morning. Amen. You had an active role to play. God does not drag you to an altar where you are born again or drag you out of some places where you shouldn't be or there's a cooperation. So when it comes to spiritual things, there is cooperation. Now the day of Pentecost, there were known languages that people heard being spoken. In verse 11, uh, the people said, we hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. It was a very unique evidence, public evidence that heaven had invaded earth. It wasn't the only evidence, but it was the first one. And, and here these people were blessed to hear the glories of God in their own native languages. Inside the room, inside the upper room, there was more. There was a sound, right? Uh, the sound of, like a mighty rushing wind. And there was what looked like cloven tongues of fire resting on each head. But those evidences weren't for the general public. We have no evidence that the people outside the room saw or heard those things. But what they did hear was God getting all of the praise, and they were hearing it in their native language. I, I forget offhand what it was. Uh, I think 15 different people groups that are mentioned uh, were in town for the Jewish Old Testament Feast of Pentecost that heard this. So can you imagine all the different people groups and all the different languages, and they're able to hear all of this going on, hearing actual languages. So on the outside, that's what they heard. On the inside, try to imagine and just put yourself in this place. Here's this room where they had met uh, probably on a pretty regular basis for the last 10 days, ever since Jesus ascended. They didn't know what was going to happen. Jesus didn't tell them all the details of what was going to happen. He just told them, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come among you. So what did they do? They went home and kicked back and watched TV. Yeah. Oh, okay. I thought maybe they had other things more important to do. No, they met together for prayer. And while they were meeting together for prayer, I want you to try to let your mind imagine what the room looked like. The Bible says there was about 120 people. So you had the apostles. You probably had some of their families. You had other disciples. He mentions the women. Luke mentions the women, specifically Jesus, the mother of Mary, and Jesus' brothers and sisters, all in this room. How about that? The Virgin Mary was a tongue-talking Pentecostal. And there had to be a buzz. There had to be a little uh, unknowing, but there had to be a buzz. I would love to hear what that sounded like in that room. It wasn't quiet. It was loud. Can I tell you something? That these people that began to speak in other tongues on the day of Pentecost, they didn't go from being meek and mute to being boldly proclaiming the works of God in an unknown tongue. No, I'm pretty sure they were vocal to begin with in their own language, giving honor and glory to God. Cooperation. They were ready. They were psyched. They didn't know what it was going to be, but they were all in. They were ready for everything. They canceled all their doctor's appointments. They changed the kids' schedule for school, and they got together. And they met for prayer for 10 days. Not 10 minutes, 10 days. 10 days. Nothing would ever be the same. Can you imagine what happened on that day of Pentecost? This would have been the talk of the town. The first two things that we hear about happening in that room, the, the sound of the mighty rushing wind, uh, the tongues of fire that appeared, they had no interaction with that. It was something that happened to them. But the third thing, the, the evidence, the witness to other people, well, that was something that God did in and through them. They could not be passive when it came to their ability to speak in unknown tongues. That was an active thing. And I think it's incredible 
that God appointed ordinary men and women to be together in that room. Uh, people that uh, maybe the world would not elevate as celebrities, the people that did not have the right kind of pedigree, but yet God chose humble, just humble men and women, boys and girls, to come together and to be there and be present, have prayed into this world-changing event that happened on that first day of Pentecost in the life of the church. You know, in the past, God always spoke. He spoke in many different ways. We think about uh, when the Ten Commandments were given on Mount Sinai, God spoke and people perceived it as thunderings and lightnings. It was, it's written as a simile. It was like thunder. It was like lightning. That's what we have to understand. But it had to be different than thunder or lightning because most people were probably not scared to death of thunder and lightning. But in this case, they were because they knew that God was speaking. God spoke to Moses. God spoke to prophets. All through the Old Testament, we can read about how God spoke to his appointed men and women. He spoke to judges. He spoke to kings. But this was different. This was different. This was unique. Never happened before. God made a distinction that something that had never happened before was now designed to be part and parcel of what it meant to be a believer in and follower of Jesus. So through the infilling of the Holy Spirit in a resident sense, so to speak. In the Old Testament, there were prophets that spoke for God, and, and we read that they were filled with the Holy Spirit, and it was for a purpose. It was to proclaim something to the people. But now, because of Jesus, we could become containers that God could, not that we can contain the Holy Spirit, but God could pour His Holy Spirit into us. I like the phrase, baptized in the Holy Spirit, not baptism of, because Jesus is the baptizer, but we are immersed in the Holy Spirit. It's like getting in the pool, right? You're immersed in the water, and it feels good, doesn't it? This is what we talk about, this, this second blessing, this second work that God does after we are born again. When you're born again, you receive the Holy Spirit. Absolutely. We could not be born again without the indwelling Holy Spirit. This is an immersion, and this is what God wants for all of His children. This infilling in the Holy Spirit in a resident sense, only because of Jesus, that God Himself in the person of the Holy Spirit could come and take up residence in us. Man, oh man. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. What? There's no one here that has the pedigree for that. Amen. There's nobody in this place that could earn that. None of us, the greatest person on earth, could not earn that. And this is what God wants for his children. This wouldn't be a one-time thing. This sign of speaking in tongues. Jesus talked about that in the passage in Mark 16, even before Pentecost. And one of the things that, that all who believe would, would do, we will speak in other tongues. And what's that all about? Why did he do that? These signs. It's one of these signs. And it would come as a work of the Father and of the Son, following or at the time of salvation. Remember when John the Baptist was preaching and he was baptizing uh, other, other uh, Jewish, Jewish believers uh, before the cross, before Jesus, and he was uh, baptizing them in a baptism of repentance. It was a symbolic thing. Water rituals were nothing new in Jewish life. The symbolism of washings uh, for ceremonial purposes. And John the Baptist came baptizing and said, repent, repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And he said of Jesus, he says, look, I'm baptizing in water, but one is coming who will baptize you in the Holy Spirit. Amen. And this is what Jesus does to all believers. John never experienced that. Let that sink in a little bit. 
John the Baptist never experienced that to the degree that you can experience it today. That infilling, that, that immersion in the Holy Spirit. He spoke of one who would baptize in the Holy Spirit. It's a second work, and it's something that God wants for every believer. There is more. There is more. There's always more. I don't care how much history you have with Jesus. It doesn't matter how often you have been used in the miraculous spiritual gifts. It doesn't matter if you pray and speak in tongues every day. There's more. There's always more. You never arrive. That's the beauty of walking with Jesus. You never arrive. When we see him face to face and we'll no longer need faith, then we'll have a full understanding of what it means to be redeemed. But until then, there's always more. Don't ever sit back and think you've gone far enough. Don't ever think, well, I've achieved this, 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 and this. No, no, no. There's always more. There's evidence in Scripture that this, this whole speaking in tongues thing happened time and time again. God went to great lengths in the book of Acts. Chapters 10 and 11 are all about God arranging something that when I look at it with human eyes, I think there had to be an easier way to do this. There was a gentleman named Cornelius in he was a man who feared God. He was not a Jew. He was a Greek. He wasn't even a Jewish proselyte, but he was one who feared God and was well, well loved and well respected. He was a centurion, a Roman centurion. He lived in Caesarea. And God managed to get Peter to show up in Cornelius' house and preach the gospel. And the Bible says before he even gave the altar call, they were all filled, Cornelius and his household, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, began to praise God and speak in other tongues. Even before he had the chance to finish the deal. Now certainly I believe that Cornelius came to understand that what Peter was telling him about Jesus was true, he and his household embraced it, right? They were hungry, they were ready. And we see a, a, an account here that mirrors what happened in Acts chapter 2. We see it again in Acts chapter 19 when Paul uh, comes to Ephesus and uh, there are uh, these men who didn't really know much about the Holy Spirit and he laid hands upon them and prayed and it said they began praising God and speaking in other tongues. Now, the, every time that there was a second uh, work, a baptism in the Holy Spirit, there were out, outward signs. The other occasions, we don't know all the details of what the signs were. In Acts chapter 8, was with uh, Samaria, when Peter and John came following Philip's teaching, uh, they had already been born again. Peter and John laid hands on them, and it says they received the Holy Spirit. And uh, Simon the magician was so excited about what he saw that in his un immature state, he wanted to pay money so that he could do this for other people. But what did Simon see? Well, it's hard to know, but he'd already seen miracles. He'd already seen people healed and demons driven out, right? So this is why we speak of this as uh, an initial evidence. In Acts chapter 9, following Saul's conversion, we blinded, knocked off the horse, right? Depending on which version of the story you read, he definitely was blinded. And he said, who are you, Lord? And uh, the resurrected uh, Christ in a vision said, I'm, I am Jesus whom you persecute. And Paul, then known as Saul, uh, lost his sight, was led by the hand into Damascus, and God sent a man named Ananias. And the purpose of Ananias coming to Paul was to pray that his eyes would be opened and that he would be filled with the Holy Spirit. And Paul a little bit later on in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, he says, listen, I speak in tongues more than you all. So we know that this was a part of the Apostle Paul's life. We've been studying uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14. 
And the problem with the church in Corinth was not that they weren't being used in the gifts of the Spirit. They were immature in how they were handling it. So Paul came to give some, some advice and some, some, uh, some order of worship yeah. or order in worship. They had a big deal going on with tongues. It was getting out of control. And Paul said, let me tell you about this gift and about the different uses for the gift of tongues. It was obviously a common practice in the early church, misunderstood from the beginning, no doubt about it. And I do not believe that the gift ever ceased entirely. We live in a day and an age where you can get online and you can get something instantly. News is instantaneous. The newspapers are like old news, right? Back through history, it wasn't always that way. It's amazing to me that the letters that we have in our New Testament uh, it's amazing that they were written down, recorded, ordered of the Holy Spirit, so that we have the benefit of opening up our nice Bibles today and reading these letters that people like Paul and Peter and James wrote to Christians in the early church. But there was a period of time where communication was not that good. There were civilizations where people rose to power even in an ecclesiastical sense, people in the church that wanted to keep other people down. There was illiteracy. People didn't know. And it seems like for a long period of time, these gifts kind of ceased. But you know, and I know, that no matter what, there's always a remnant. Yeah. There are always people that are hungry for God. Yeah. And I do not believe that any of these supernatural gifts ceased completely. I believe we may not have history books about him, but I know the heart of God is that he gets the heart of his people. But when we start looking at when things started to shift, when we start looking at people's education and, and the printing press and, and the Reformation period, where now all of a sudden people were able to read the Word of God in their own native language, something that was just not possible. Do you know that there are people that died, died, so that you could have a copy of the Word of God right. in your native language. There were people that were burnt at the stake for heresy, for daring to make the Bible available. And as people became educated and they started seeing these things and they saw what the early church was like and they realized that, wow, there's a whole new dimension of living for Christ that I was not aware of. And we see how God began to move the church. And people started to get hungry again. And we see what happened all through the years with the first great awakening and the second great awakening in Europe and then in America. We see things that happened in the 1800s, the late 1800s, the revivals that began to grow, the supernatural things that started to happen again. And then in our own tradition, we can look back to the early 1900s we look in Europe. So many things started in Europe. The Welsh Revival of the early 1900s. Young people, young people got on fire for God and changed a nation. We saw what happened in the United States. In the United States when we saw the contemporary Pentecostal revivals. The, the outpouring in Topeka, Kansas at Bethel Bible School where Charles Parham had a class of kids and and said, I want you to examine the scriptures and I want you to see if there is an initial evidence of being filled with the Holy Spirit. I want you to, by scripture, figure this out. What are the most common things that we see? And Parham went away for a while and when he came back, they, they said, you know what? It's speaking in tongues. And there was a young lady, I'm not quite sure how old she was, but she was young, Agnes Osmond will forever go down in history as the first one in contemporary times to speak in an unknown tongue. Boy, that spread like wildfire. That spread like wildfire as an initial evidence of the baptism in the Holy Spirit. We see what happened in Los Angeles on Azusa Street. Very humble surroundings. Very humble surroundings. The people that were part of that incredible outpouring were people from the wrong side of the track. People that society looked down upon. They, they met in this old broken down building that had been used 
most recently as a place to park the horses. And they cleaned up, you can imagine. And they had some rough wooden benches and a low ceiling. And they went after God. And there were accounts of limbs growing out where stumps used to be. There was a fog that settled in. And whenever the fog settled in, people got healed. There were people that were not only speaking, but singing and even accounts of writing in tongues. In unknown language to them, people from other parts of the world started coming in and they recognized their native language. Wow. Incredible thing. This isn't that long ago, folks. This is what spawned the modern day Pentecostal movement of re-embracing uh, the, the, the <coughs> miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit and realizing that this is nothing new, this is something old, but it had been rediscovered. And part of that, all along the way, seems to have been this speaking in tongues, most misunderstood, very uh, heavily criticized. Even people, when they see biblical evidence, decide not to believe it. And on the other extreme, we have people that elevate it to a place where it need not be. It's just one of the gifts. But the benefits to this are incredible. Uh, and, and here we get into to, to something that you hear me say a lot. If, if you hear this and you say, nah, I think I'm all right. If you hear that there's more, and something in you says, yeah, maybe for somebody else. If you have to ask, why would I want any of this? It could be that you've just not yet gone deep enough into the promises of God. And, and being convinced that not only are there deeper promises to embrace, but that God wants you to embrace it. Yes. Yes. He wants you to go deeper. Yes. It's not false humility, right? Oh God, I could never ask you for more. And he's begging you yes. to take yes. it. Yes. In a public worship setting, we've been talking about this. First Corinthians 14, the whole chapter is on prophecy and tongues what their proper use is in a public worship setting. And if I could pick a summary passage of Scripture to kind of summarize the whole thing, I would pick 1 Corinthians 14, 27 and 28. If any speak in a tongue, let there be only two or three at most, and each in turn, and let someone interpret. But if there was no one to interpret, let each of them keep silent in the church and speak to himself and to God. When we come together to worship, if someone has a message in tongues, we carve out on purpose. You may have noticed that there are on purpose times where we're quiet. We want to encourage. If you have a message from the Lord and you feel you have it in tongues, we want you to give it. If you feel you have a, a prophecy or a word, we want you to give it. In a public setting, it should be properly interpreted by someone with a gift of interpretation. If you feel you're in a place where it would be out of order or other people would not understand, your best to be quiet and pray to yourself. Amen. So we have three different purposes for speaking in tongues as outlined in Scripture. And I want to focus on this one today. We talked about initial evidence. We talked about uh, public worship. I want to focus on the third one today, and that's personal edification. Personal edification. 1 Corinthians 14, the first five verses are contrasting tongues and prophecy and public worship. And they're not making the case for personal edification in context, but it, also, it does speak to that. Now, I'll explain what I mean. Verse 2 says, For one who speaks in a tongue speaks not to men but to God. For no one understands him, but he utters mysteries in the Spirit. Now, in context, he's saying... If, if you're in a public worship setting and 
no one has interpretation, it doesn't benefit the whole church because you're speaking mysteries. But also within this, it says there is a benefit. It is edifying, right? For no one understands him. He utters mysteries in the spirit. We are spiritual beings at our very core. The spirit, the part that's going to live on. The part that Jesus died to redeem. That deep down inside, can't put your finger on it, but it's there. That part of you that's going to live forever is the part that is redeemed. And that is why God, through his Holy Spirit, can now speak to us, because that part of us has been made new. So when we have the opportunity to speak, even if we, in our mortal ears and even our, our mind, doesn't understand what we're saying, we can know that what we are saying agrees with God. I mean, I want to be in agreement with God. Amen. This edifies me knowing that even when I don't understand what I'm saying in those times, that I am speaking forth things that honor God. And that in that time, he can also turn around and instruct my mind what it is that the conversation is about. So that's edification and growth. And, and that is a, 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 an incredible thing. In the spirit, there's one language, the language of heaven. Amen. Our spirit communing with the Holy Spirit. First part of verse 4 in uh, chapter 14 of 1 Corinthians says, the one who speaks in a tongue builds up himself, edifies, built up. It speaks to personal growth. And what did Paul say in verse 15? He said, well, what am I to do then? Well, I'll pray with my spirit, but I'll pray with my mind also. I'll do both. I will sing praise with my spirit, but I will sing with my mind also. Amen. I've been doing more of that lately, singing in the spirit. That's a new song. Don't even know what the lyrics are, but I know it's a good song. Praying in the Spirit. We're encouraged to pray in the Spirit in many places in the New Testament. Ephesians 6, 18. Praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. Jude uh, chapter 1. But you... Uh, beloved, building yourself up in your most holy faith, faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. And building ourselves up, pray in the Spirit. Written by Jude, the half-brother Jesus, think about it, he was there on the day of Pentecost along with the rest of his family. Romans 8, 26 and 27 says, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Boy, there's, there's a lot here. But I love I loved the idea that I can pray for the will of God. That, that praying in the Spirit, I can know that I'm praying in the will of God. The Spirit knows the will of God because the Spirit is God, right? right? Yeah. And this, while this is referring to times where there are no words, how many have been there? Yeah. You come before God and you're just, you're broken or you recognize that there's something, but you don't even know how to put words to it. And all you can get out is, oh, even in that, that there is praying in the spirit but it doesn't diminish the benefit of speaking aloud in unknown tongues when our own words aren't adequate the new testament is filled with commands to be filled in the holy spirit with the holy spirit examples of being filled in, with the spirit and uh, examples of the results of being filled even beyond that baptism in the Spirit and initial evidence of tongues, there are times when God may call you apart for a special purpose. And the Bible speaks of those filled with the Spirit, a refilling, right? We can't just check off a box and think, oh, we got it all fixed now. I'm set, ready to see Jesus. Well, you are ready to see Jesus, but maybe not quite exploring the depths that he wants you to explore. 
This is the Christian life and experience. This is the way God designed it to be. It's not just tongues or prophecy or gifts of healing or what we do here in the building. It's not one thing to the exclusion of others. It's not going our way and redefining or restricting what God has established either. It's not what we do or don't do as much as it is what we love or don't love. If you love God, if you love God, your purpose is to stay as close to Him as you can. If you love God, you will embrace what He has for you according to His Word. Well, what about praying or speaking? We talk about praying in tongues and speaking in tongues. Is it the same thing? Well, kind of, but not. Let me give you some examples. There's a benefit to speaking in tongues. There's a benefit to praying in tongues. And the Bible speaks to both. But listen, there's a time to pray. And there's a time to declare There's a time when praying about something is not appropriate because God has already revealed His will. There's a time to seek God, and there's a time to obey God. There's a time to cut bait, there's a time to fish. Most Christians do more praying than declaring, and a lot of them use false humility to disguise it. If we are not acting on or declaring what God has already <coughs> declared to be true and His will, it's disobedience. And that may sound irreligious to say, stop praying about it. <coughs> I'm telling you, sometimes it can be an excuse to not move. Like the man at the pool, 38 years. You want to be healed? Well, I can't get into the pool. And what he has. God was making his will plain to this man that he wanted him to be healed. If we have been in church all our lives and cannot discern the character and nature of God to the point that everything we do requires praying about it, then we're missing something. Amen. Peter and John in Acts chapter 3 walked in toward the, the temple, right? Toward the, the gate called Beautiful and saw the lame beggar. There's nothing in the Bible that says they stopped to pray for him. said, silver and gold I don't have, but what I have I give you in the name of Jesus. Rise up and walk. Yes, sir. Jesus with the man in John chapter 5 that I mentioned earlier, he did no evidence that he stopped and prayed for him. He said, pick up your bed and walk. Right. Right. And I know, I know that there have been many excesses on this. I know there are people who have gone over the bumper and guardrail on this. And I know they have, and you've probably heard of it too. You know, like the lady I heard about that went to the car dealer, I think I told you before, told the, told the person at the dealer, my father is going to pay for this, and he let her take the car. And She didn't mean her earthly father, she meant God. She had no clue how she was going to pay for it. And they took the car back, of course. But don't let the stories of the excesses keep you from doing what God has already promised you you can do. Huh? Yeah. As many people who have strayed from biblical boundaries on this, there are many more who have not even gotten close. Amen. These signs will accompany those who believe. In my name they'll cast out demons, they'll speak in new tongues, they'll pick up serpents with their hands, and if they drink any deadly poison, it will not hurt them. They will lay their hands on the sick, and they will recover. No mention of praying here. 
it, 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 it's rightly inferred that as these believers go in the power of the Holy Spirit, as these believers witness about Jesus, they're going to encounter some things that they're going to need supernatural help with. As they go, these signs will follow the proclamation of the word. It does not say the signs will follow praying about it. It says it, they will, these signs will follow. We don't set out to derivate from biblical boundaries in doing so. We don't look for demons and look for serpents and drink all the poison we can <laughs> to try to prove how much faith we have. No, that's putting hope in ourselves. But there's no discerning the will of God in these things. God <laughs> desires that we be bold, be filled with the Spirit, and take full advantage of the arsenal that He's placed at our disposal. For our own glory? No. For the glory of God. And for the sake of those who are far from Him. So there's a time to speak. There's a time to speak with English or whatever your native language is. And there's a time to understand that there are times that I said that twice, but there are times, there's the third time, that God wants to have us speak a mystery to us, but we're communicating with the Holy Spirit, and in turn, that Holy Spirit is going to edify us. If you can't, if you can't be in public and praise the Lord in English, you're not going to do it in a heavenly language. So what about when we hear tongues? Is it a real language? Is it a heavenly language? Well, it can be both. Yeah. Beginning of 1 Corinthians chapter 13, Paul says, If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, I have not love, a noisy gong and a clanging cymbal. Tongues of men are known languages. Tongues of angels are unknown. And he is saying, listen, I can do all that. But if I don't have love, I'm missing the point. That's why we've taken now ninth week to talk about spiritual things in church, to talk about the gifts of the Holy Spirit, specifically the manifestation gifts from 1 Corinthians 12. And there's some things we shouldn't speak. If it be thy will has destroyed many good prayers, If it be thy will, has sent more people to an early grave. Please, know his will. Know his will. Absolutely going to pray according to his will. Man, oh man. That just takes all the faith out of the room. We come and we say, we pray for healing. that This person would be restored. And then we just cop out say, if it be thy will. And God's like, yeah, I want them to die. I want them to suffer. I understand there are things we don't understand. I understand there are people who pass and we don't, we wonder why. And there, there is a bigger mystery to all this. But guess what? We don't have to figure out that mystery. That's up to God. And someday we'll understand those things. But walking in the authority of Christ we must be bold and declare some things. Yes, yeah. And one way that we declare the will of God is allowing him to work in us that we have this incredible privilege of being able to speak and pray in this unknown Amen. language. And I think we've overcomplicated it. I think we've made it too difficult. When we're saved and we give our life to Jesus and maybe we pray a prayer or maybe it's just a knowing that this is a turning point in my life. We accept by faith that God has forgiven us through Jesus. We believe that we have a new life and we walk accordingly. It's all by faith. And if there's an initial evidence of salvation, certainly it's a changed life, right? right. That's the fruit that we bear, a changed life. Not a perfect life. Not that we've got it all together right away. But there is an initial evidence of a changed life. 
So when we come before God, who wants us to have all good gifts, and we say, I want to be immersed in your Holy Spirit, we've got to live as if he is answering that prayer. We've got to walk as if the power is going to be there when we need it. We, we, we don't just do this and then go back into our puddle and, and pray about it some more. There has to be an understanding that God is faithful. And we may not understand it. We definitely don't understand it. But we walk by faith. And part of that is this evidence that we talk about that the Bible seems to indicate that those who are filled will have the ability to do this. Speaking in tongues does not fill you with the Holy Spirit. Right. You don't have to do anything. You get to. Right? Yeah. right? Yes. And, and we've, we've, we've made this so much a matter of a doctrine, and it's in our doctrine that we believe the initial phys physical evidence of speaking in tongues. But can we just get past the doctrine for a minute and just go ahead and declare and walk and trust and say, Lord, I'm just going to have everything you have for me. I'm going to be bold for you. I'm going to witness for you. And, and, and you're going to see a difference in the way you live your life. So when it comes to this, please, let's just not, let's not beat ourselves up. Let's just walk into it. Yeah. Speaking in tongues is God's way of helping us declare what we may not even be aware of yeah. until such time as he makes us aware. Now, how many times, whether in English or whether in tongues. I've had times of prayer with God, and before I can even get out what I'm looking for, he comes around the back and gives me the answer. There are other times that it seems like a year goes by, and I still don't have the answer. If we stop looking at it as a means to an end, if we stop looking at this relationship with God as we're coming to get an answer to something or we're coming to get a provision, if we stop looking at God as a means to an end and simply look, look at the, 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 the experience with him as growing and being more like Jesus and being privy to heavenly truths and just plug in and say, I'm just going to follow we turn God from some kind of celestial Santa Claus into one who wants relationship with us. And this is just one way that he has made this possible. I want to encourage you to always keep your mind open to these things.